Brands. Products. The two words that have come to define the film industry in 2023. We've got Air, Tetris, Pinball, Blackberry. Last month, we even got a major motion picture about flaming Hot Cheetos. And another releasing later this month about the flippin' Beanie Babies. So, uh, what the, what the heck's going on with all these movies, huh? And, and why now? Is this just another example of Hollywood running out of ideas that films about companies and commodities are all we have left to make? Are these just light-hearted flicks you watch on the plane and never think about again? Or does this IP stampede carry some sort of deeper meaning? Hi, I'm Elliot, and before I speak about each of these films and try to answer those questions, we first need to identify where these movies fit in amongst the current status of cinema. So you're probably aware that the movies that have been dominating at the box office for the past decade have been Marvel films, Disney's live action remakes, and sequels and reboots of beloved franchises. Familiar properties that aren't exactly going anywhere, but now there's finally been some major fatigue setting in with this business model. Marvel's post endgame strategy has undoubtedly been quantity over quality, with an abundance of mostly disposable, ugly looking movies and corresponding homework in the form of streaming TV shows being peddled out on Disney's never ending convention a belt of content. Fine, fine, mouse, fine, mouse, rat, fine, syringe. And as for DC, well, man, I have no idea what those guys are doing. Speaking of Disney, most of their Renaissance era animated films have since been turned into live action remakes, so they're now resorting to remaking films that came out just seven years ago. That a live action reimagining of Moana is in the works. Oh boy. Studios are running out of popular franchises to reboot, The Fast and the Furious are on their 10th friggin' installment, and people have frankly had enough. Over the past year, box office numbers for these type of movies, while still huge, have been falling greatly, often not enough to cover their own insanely massive budgets. However, appetite to go to the cinema is still there, in fact, it's back in a big way. The Barbenheimer phenomenon is the first time in box office history where two films have opened to over $80 million each. Barbie may be a brand, but neither of these two films come from a franchise, so to hit those kind of numbers, I mean, that's a watershed moment in modern cinema. In the words of Tom Cruise, people just want to go back to the movies. I am done with streaming. I want to sit in a dark room with sticky floors and watch Oppenheimer in IMAX until I don't remember who the fuck I am anymore. Audiences have been crying out for something, anything else, and 2023 could be the year where this shift takes place. As well as these original summer blockbusters, we're also seeing a return of the kind of movie selections we used to get when I was younger. Light-hearted rom-coms, broadly appealing buddy comedies. It's becoming clear that audiences want more than just recognizable IP. We want engaging original stories as well. But what if you could have both? Enter the brand biopic. A particular genre of film that kind of came out of nowhere, but this year has quickly taken over our screens. These films are about the creation of a brand, or the story of the invention, distribution, or acquisition of a key product. We've seen films like this before, ranging from the brilliance of 2010's The Social Network to the adequacy of 2016's The Founder. But for some strange reason, in 2023, it was decided that this would be the year of the brand biopic at large. And even when they're not biographical, we've got films that are essentially a representation of the brand and itself, like the Super Mario Brothers movie, and Barbie for that matter. It's like all of a sudden studios have realized that they can make a pretty penny off the backs of already established properties, and now these biographical tales of commercial and capitalist success are apparently the stories we need to know about. And hey, I've dabbled in similar films before on this channel, I've talked about several music biopics on here, and I also made that one video where I compared the two very different films about Steve Jobs. It's Hit subscribe and maybe it'll pop into your feed. Go on, I dare you. So I figure if there was anyone equipped to talk about these movies, it's probably still someone else, but you've got me instead. How, how fun for you. I have watched all of the brand biopics of 2023, and I'm now gonna go through them with you and attempt to find some sort of connective tissue between these movies. Is this a case of Hollywood running out of ideas? Are these films even any good? What are the morals, the themes, and more broadly, the point of all these movies? And what are we as audiences expected to take away from them? And speaking of brands, it's time to briefly talk about today's sponsor, me, or more specifically, my Patreon page, a place where you can watch a brand new bonus video every month. Recently, I've discussed my favorite movie sound Soundtrack. There's one where I get into the Weird Al biopic spoof, and even a big old Q&A featuring talk of my favorite directors, my love for the TV show Lost, and of course a ton of Beatles chat. It's only a few bucks a month, and if you do like my videos, this is the best way to support me. Anyway, uh, back to the corporate product biopics now. Thank you. 
To begin with, we're talking about... The film that kicked off this ongoing trend that made people go, they're making a film about that? Written by Alex Convery, who wanted to explore the Air Jordan story after watching the Netflix documentary, The Last Dance, Air is the story of the Nike company transforming the sneaker world on its head by acquiring an unprecedented deal with rookie basketball player Michael Jordan in 1984. Of the three major sneaker brands, the other two being Adidas and Converse, Nike is squarely on the bottom of the totem pole, being seen as more of an aging brand for runners only. Nike is a damn jogging company, man. Black people don't jog. Matt Damon plays Sonny Vaccaro, the man tapped to find the new spokesperson for the basketball shoe division, which is on the cusp of shutting down. Vaccaro, inspired by an Arthur Ashe commercial for Head Rackets, determines that he needs a once in a lifetime talent for this to work, that being Michael Jordan. I wanna sign him. We build a shoe line around just him. We tap into something deeper, into the player's identity. He doesn't wear the shoe. He is the shoe. The shoe is him. And the rest of the film is Sonny working out ways he can convince Jordan to sign with Nike. Sonny, we can't get fucking Michael Jordan. He's too expensive. Despite the fact that the basketballer is a huge fan of Adidas and even prefers Converse as a backup. Michael is an Adidas guy. He loves Adidas. That's all he wear. Them badass warm-up suits, shell toe. The odds are stacked against Sonny in every way possible. And what makes the film as entertaining as it is, is watching Sonny rethink strategy after strategy to get Jordan to come to Nike. Ultimately, Vaccaro ends up going against the wishes of Jordan's sports agent and flies directly to Michael's parents in North Carolina, where Dolores Jordan, played superbly by Viola Davis, hears Sonny's pitch. Because I believe in your son. I believe he's different. And I believe you might be the only person on earth who knows it. Once the Jordans have agreed to meet with the Nike team, Sonny stops the prepared video and speaks directly to Michael. Sonny tells him he's gonna win championships. That it's, it's an American story, and that's why Americans are gonna love it. You could really say the same thing about the film Air. At its core, it's a film about the underdog working hard to achieve ultimate success, and Americans love an underdog story. Heck, we all do. A shoe is just a shoe until somebody steps into it, then it has meaning. But as we watch this underdog story, we do need to stay cognizant of the fact that this is Nike we're talking about. Sure, back in the early 80s, they were a more modest running shoe company, but now they're not only the largest sportswear brand, but the largest apparel brand in the world. And that's where you sit up and go, is this just a two hour commercial for Nike? Uh, am, am I being tricked here? Well, I think the answer to that is both a yes and no. This film absolutely makes you root for Nike. It's not only the compelling story, but it's also the cast. The ragtag bunch of Nike guys are all such likable dudes and the chemistry between them all is wonderful. Affleck, who also directs the film, is a lot of fun as the semi-spiritual shoe dog Nike CEO, Phil Knight, and seeing him once again playing off Matt Damon is a real treat. There is no self, there's just the non-self. The non-self. That's right. Does the Dalai Lama have a grape colored Porsche, Phil? You believe this relationship 100%. Chris Tucker is an absolute delight to see back on screen and adds a ton of levity and humor that only he can bring. And Jason Bateman is also top notch. Woven Through is an undercurrent of 80s nostalgia with popular songs from the time playing at key moments. And you've got Ben Affleck dripped out in colorful Nike garb. Throw all these elements together and you've got a very watchable film, which is a success in its own right. What a lot of these films have in common is how their settings don't inspire much in the way of cinematic escapism. They take place primarily in offices, hallways, boardrooms, and other nondescript spaces in which men in suits discuss business, which does not always lend itself to exhilarating action. So the fact that this movie keeps you engaged and doesn't waste time with extraneous detail is to its credit. Something that struck me, and I know many others, as slightly odd about Air is that Michael Jordan is not a character with any kind of agency. He says about three words in the entire film and all the shots of him are from the back or when he's obscured. You never see his face and it gives him a kind of Wilson from Home Improvement vibe or like an adult character in a Cartoon Network show. The real Michael Jordan wasn't directly involved in the film but did meet with Affleck and gave it his blessing. Having him appear as a non-active participant in the story may have been a clause in said blessing and it's not a huge issue but it does bring me to the point that I started it a minute ago and 
quickly lost track of. This is not Michael Jordan's story. This is Sonny and Nike's story. This is not a tale of incredible athletic ability and fame. It is one of commercial success and unprecedented levels of marketing in the guise of a kind of David versus Goliath narrative. And this is what I mean about are we being tricked here? You've got freaking Amazon, the big bad Bezos company who exists purely to cannibalize any kind of competition in its path, making a film about a genius business move from Nike, the biggest apparel brand on earth. Sure, it's charming and very enjoyable and we watch it and root for the Davids, but the irony is that it's a movie made by and propping up the biggest of the Goliaths. Yeah, look, there's plenty to like about Air. I guess what I'm trying to say is it just sort of left me feeling like I watched an Amazon movie about how rad the Nike Corporation is. But given everything else that works so well in this film, it's not something I'm gonna lose sleep over. <laughs> This is actually something of a trend in these movies as our next pick finds itself in a similar situation. Tetris is a film about the creation, distribution, and rights of one of the world's most popular video games and it was made by the world's most popular tech company, Apple. Wow. I don't think this is as much of an elephant in the room as Amazon and Nike. Tetris is hardly a Fortune 500 company and Apple's connection to it appears more incidental than sinister. They even have a cute way of showing this in their credits. The film begins in 1988 and follows the story of Hank Rogers, an American gaming entrepreneur played by Taron Egerton. <laughs> who we first see spruiking a self-designed game at a convention which nobody is taking notice of. Instead, the crowd is drawn to a Russian game called Tetris. It's a combination of Tetra, Greek for four, all the game's pieces are variants of four, and tennis. Rogers is blown away by what he sees and goes on a journey to become a part of its inevitable success. He discovers that Tetris was created by Russian programmer Alexei Pajitnov, who works for Elorg, a vague company overseen by the Soviet government. At this point, the rights to the game are owned by media tycoon Robert Maxwell and his annoying son and CEO of Mirosoft, Kevin. Good to meet you, Kevin. Uh, uh, uh. It's Mr. Maxwell to you, sir. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Who agreed to sell to Rogers the rights to Tetris in Japan for PC, console, and possibly arcade. Rogers has a meeting with Nintendo and is allowed a preview of their new handheld device, the Game Boy, which is planning to be released with Super Mario Land. This game is programmed in C, yeah? Mm-hmm. Why? Rogers convinces Nintendo to release it instead with Tetris and promises to obtain handheld licensing rights. From there, the film really kicks into gear and becomes a thrilling, if somewhat convoluted story in the form of the acquisition power play and distribution of Tetris. The Soviet Union believed they never ceded ownership of the game as anything created in their country belongs to them. Mirosoft realized they had done a dirty deal. Are you selling handheld Tetris to Atari behind my back? Kevin. And Hank Rogers is just trying to sell Tetris to Nintendo so he can keep his family afloat. For a film that mainly consists of flights and cab rides from building in Japan to building in Soviet Russia, it moves along at a cracking speed, and I really have to give it credit. It takes what would otherwise be dull and boring business rhetoric and instead makes you feel like you're watching an exciting spy movie, albeit by pumping it so full of Hollywood hijinks that by the time we arrive at the tense car chase to escape the Russian government near the end, it barely feels like a factual movie at all. <laughs> It avoids further pitfalls of its own bland settings by incorporating a bunch of bright and colorful 8-bit graphics when introducing characters or setting up establishing shots that make you feel like the film itself is a video game you're playing. It's further aided by a delightful soundtrack consisting of reworkings of the original Tetris theme, retro synth pop, and Russian vaporwave that add a ton of character and kind of reminds me of the fourth season of Stranger Things. Unlike The Social Network, The Founder, and even Air, the Tetris movie is probably the least concerned with the product itself. What it does, how it impacts people, because there's not much there there. It's not a groundbreaking social network that brings people together, or the most popular burger, or a shoe that makes you feel like Michael Jordan. It's Tetris, an addictive video game where you move blocks down a well to get a high score. The most they can say about its appeal and impact happens in the first five minutes, where Rogers calls Tetris the most, most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, Eddie. I played Tetris for five minutes. I still see falling blocks in my dreams. It's poetry, art and math, all working in magical synchronicity. It's, it's the perfect game. 
I actually loved how we learned that Pajitnov's first demo of the game was coded by using parentheses pushed together to create the blocks. As an avid fan of video games myself, stuff like that really interests me, but it's pretty much all we get about the actual lore of Tetris, if you will. I think Taron Egerton gives an engaged and committed performance and makes sure the ball of excitement never drops. But putting his talents aside for a second, the actual casting of Egerton is rather strange to me. The real life Hank Rogers was a Dutch born man raised in the US and is of partial but noticeable Indonesian descent. By casting Egerton, a Welsh actor of English descent, the film is essentially guilty of whitewashing its lead role. I don't look anything like Eric Taron or he doesn't look anything <laughs> like me. Some may chalk this up to colorblind casting, but in a film where ethnic and cultural identity plays a major role in the film's story, we come from different worlds. I do think it was a bizarre choice from Apple who are usually more cognizant of proper representation within their own media. Prior to shooting, Edgerton likened the film more towards the social network than the Lego movie, and I can see where this comparison comes into play. But I think a major point of difference between the two films is the writing. Whilst entertaining, the script holds none of the Shakespearean or rhythmic quality of an Aaron Sorkin screenplay and sometimes feels like it's hitting you over the head with its video game metaphors. Kevin Maxwell pulled a piranha plant on me. He reneged on my arcade rights and I really need a mushroom to stay alive. Like, bro, this man works for Nintendo. You don't need to dumb it down for him this much. Attempts at fleshing out Hank Rogers' character with family drama such as missing his daughter's dance recital come off as cliche and shoehorned into the plot, similar to Jason Bateman's off-screen daughter in Air. Whilst it primarily is a light and airy biodrama, the film does scratch the surface of certain provocative themes such as a person's right to their own enterprise. I'm gonna make you a millionaire. I do not have right to receive money from my game. Well, that, that's criminal. No, it is communism. And the merits of capitalism's rise over the Soviet Union's dying communism. Once you let capitalists through your gates, they will never leave. I think the Soviet Union's involvement was a fascinating part of this deal, and I was hoping for a slightly deeper exploration of its impact. The world is changing, gentlemen, and Soviet Union will not be left behind. But all that takes a backseat for the ensuing action that dominates the second half of the film. But after all, it is Tetris we're talking about, how how heavily should they really imply that the sale of a Game Boy game led to the fall of the Soviet Union? The film ends with the song Opportunities by Pet Shop Boys, and we see our Tetris heroes win the deal and the day while Neil Tennant sings, I've got the brains, you've got the looks. Honestly, I think they said the quiet part out loud there. Whether it be Hank Rogers' success or Apple producing the film, Wow. Let's Make Lots of Money ends up being the major takeaway of Tetris for me. The lesson, like with Air, is break all the rules, put family aside, and risk your life and well being to get the deal done. And when you get it, you're rich, baby, you win. Money equals success. These films are pretty black and white about it. Like, I could imagine a version of this film that looked at Tetris's impact in the gaming industry or examining the birth of handheld games, but this this isn't that movie. But look, even though the message may leave a strange taste in one's mouth, overall, I like Tetris. Truth bending and bland locations aside, the film is very well made and knows that a great story is a great story. And what's more is that it's one that practically no one knew about before this film. Speaking of stories no one knows about, how about a film no one knows about? <laughs> Man, this movie barely feels like it should be a part of this list of brand biopics. It doesn't even have a Wikipedia page for crying out loud. Pinball is not a movie about the creation or history of the game. Rather, it's a little story of how one man legalized it for enjoyment in recreational areas in New York and other major US cities. Basically, back in the 1940s, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, New York City Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia banned pinball machines in public spaces in an effort to combat crime and prevent juvenile delinquency. Now I'm gonna stop it. He also thought the mob could controlled pinball because most of the machines were made in Chicago. Unfortunately for fans of the game, other big cities followed New York's lead and banned them en masse. Cut to the 1970s where Roger Sharp, who, oh my god, what is on that man's face? On Mike Feist's face. Oh, okay, I see now that the real Roger Sharp actually looked like that. I mean, I guess it was the 1970s after all. Never mind. Oh, and I also recently learned that it's actually pronounced Mike Feist, not Mike Feist. Uh, I can't really be bothered re-recording it all, so sorry Mike Feist. I loved you in West Side Story. So this guy, Roger Sharp, who got hooked on pinball as a college student in Wisconsin, moves to New York to be a writer where he discovers that pinball is banned in public spaces. Why are they taking the machines? We got busted. 
But why are they taking the pinball machines? Man, that's why we got busted. After getting a job writing for GQ, Sharp decides to write about pinball. The article expands into a book. A pinball book. A big book. And gets the attention of the pinball industry who recruit Sharp to advocate on their behalf before the New York City Council to legalize it once and for all. At first, Sharp is hesitant, but then agrees to testify basing his argument on the fact that pinball is not the same as gambling. It is in fact a game of skill. I want to show the city council members that they've had it wrong for all these years. This is not a game of chance. This is a game of skill. It's our job to control gambling in this city. That is a game of chance. That is a game of skill. Actually, no, it's better than that. That is a game of choices. The key moment in the film is Sharp testifying before the Manhattan courtroom by playing a game of pinball, not on the machine he brought in. The court pulls a fast one on him and makes him demonstrate on their own machine that Sharp has never played on. Despite this setback, Roger Sharp correctly shoots for every spot he aims for, including the final center lane, which changes the mind of the politicians who, based on Sharp's evidence that it's a game of skill and choices, legalizes pinball in New York City, which had a ripple effect across the country as well. Throughout the film, we also watch Roger's blossoming relationship with Ellen, the single mother who would go on to become Roger's wife. Unlike many other formulaic biopics that depict the doting wife of the lead genius of the story, Ellen is very much a central character who drives as much of the plot as Roger does. In terms of playing pinball, trying to save it, and beginning this new relationship with Ellen, Sharp equates these moments to the key phrase of the movie, but it's the choices we make with the opportunities that we are given. There's also an undeniable chemistry between Mike Faced and Crystal Reed's characters, which only adds to the charm of the movie. And this is a charming movie. It knows it's only a little story and a little film, and it even points it out in the first minute. I don't know why you want to do this. It's a great story. Oh. This is your legacy. Oh, it's a footnote. <laughs> At this point, it's unclear whether you're watching a biopic or a documentary as the older Roger Sharp discusses the story. This is actually actor Dennis Boutsakaris playing the older Roger Sharp who acts as the narrator of the film. His presence is the conduit to the audience and regularly pokes fun at his own life, the events of the film, and his mustache. He also offers fun tidbits such as a brief history of the game itself. The first pin games were nothing more than nails pounded inside an inclined wooden box and the targets were. But it did kind of make me wonder, would this story have worked better as a documentary? Oh, in fact, there's actually a drunk history episode detailing these exact events. Hey, I'm good at this. I know how to make this pinball move. And it's not chance, it's not gambling. And I do kind of think it's all this story needs to be told in an entertaining way. But with the film, you get Mike Faced, who's out here adopting a fierce Chicago accent. Seriously, he looks and sounds just like a John Mulaney character. Oh yeah, but I promise you, the past few months have aged me considerably. If I could run for president. Time for street smarts with Detective J.J. Bittenbinder. Shut up, you're all gonna die. There's really not much else to say about Pinball, the man who saved the game. It's low budget, but doesn't feel cheap or superficial. It's educational without being boring. And yeah, it's just a freaking wholesome film. Like I can't really imagine anyone hating it or docking that many points because it's just a cute movie that's not really trying to be anything but. We can't win pinball, it's just about having fun. I like it. The next film I'm gonna mention is definitely more than just a cute movie and is actually the one from this list that surprised me the most. What if we don't wanna use a Blackberry because they are stupid and pointless? I don't know if you remember the weeks leading up to the release of The Social Network back in 2010, but people did not take the prospect of a film about Facebook very seriously at all. The very idea was cringy and almost laughable, but of course it came out, surprised everybody, and has since gone on to become one of the most beloved and I think important films of this era. So much so that future films of the same genre, including Tetris, have admitted to trying to harness some of the magic that spawned from the social network, and it now seems to be the gold standard of tech and brand biopics to aspire to. But of the crop of 2023 films in this list, I think only Blackberry has come close to delivering on the writing, direction, performances, and overall tone of the social network, whilst also breaking through with its own unique identity. A key component of what makes this film so impressive is that the budget of Blackberry was only $5 million. When you compare it to the $80 million budgets of Air and Tetris made by humongous corporate behemoths, it's quite staggering how Blackberry was able to create a better film made not by Apple or Amazon, but by this guy. Ah! 
Ah! Ah! This is Matt Johnson, an independent filmmaker whose previous work includes his award-winning debut film from 2013, The Dirties, and also 2016's Operation Avalanche, both of which he wrote, directed, and starred in. He's also known as one half of the Canadian comedy sketch series, Nirvana, The Band, The Show. This is such a danceable song. <laughs> whose sketch called Update Day about the Wii Shopping Channel still lives rent-free in my head. Because everybody knows about the Wii Shopping Channel, yeah. and everybody loves to shop on it every Wednesday. Johnson's previous method of working involved loose grips with lots of improvisation, and decisions like blocking were worked out organically in the moment. Blackberry was the first film he made with actual planning, a more solid structure, and professional actors. After reading the book Losing the Signal, the untold story behind the extraordinary rise and spectacular fall of Blackberry by Jackie McNish and Sean Silkoff, Johnson chose to adapt the story of the Canadian company, partly because Johnson is a Canadian filmmaker himself and wanted to tell a Canadian story, but also because he was looking to create a more accessible film that could be enjoyed by a wider audience, whilst maintaining his signature style. Johnson continued to research extensively and met with not the big players of BlackBerry's history, but with the nameless engineers and employees who were really the beating heart of both the company and the film's ethos. What Matt Johnson came to realize was that his film wouldn't be about the history of the BlackBerry company and their products, but rather what he calls a psychology exploration of three very crazy people. Even from just the first few minutes of the film, BlackBerry's distinct look and style is immediately evident and for me, very much appreciated. Every film I've mentioned up to this point has had a fairly similar look and tone, but Blackberry cuts through as something wholly unique. Johnson wanted it to look like what he calls a fake documentary. And with the use of super long lenses in every shot, you as the audience feel like you're peeking into something classified and confidential. It actually reminds me a lot of how Succession is shot, and with the corporate white collar setting, there's plenty of links between HBO's brilliant TV show and the film Blackberry. The first sequence before the opening credits wonderfully shows shows us exactly who the, in Matt Johnson's words, three very crazy people are. We have CEO of small time tech company, Research in Motion, or RIM for short, Mike Lazaridis, played by Jay Baruchel, and his friend and co-founder of the company, Douglas Friggin, played by Johnson who are about to pitch their pocket link cellular device to wealthy businessman Jim Bolsley, played by It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia star, Glenn Howerton. Boys are out tonight, huh? Whilst waiting for the meeting to start, we can observe a clear divide between the bland corporate world and Rim's playful tech startup energy, complete with Doom t-shirt and headband. I finally understand that quote, when you grow up, your heart dies. That's from Breakfast Club, John Hughes. Do you hear that? Mike becomes distracted by a low hum in the office. There. And identifies it as an intercom on Jim's desk that's made in China. The mark of the beast. He opens it up and asks Doug for a paperclip. He's gonna fix it. That's a guy's thing. That's a guy's fucking thing. Doug then starts to panic. Meanwhile, Jim's wrapping things up with another executive. He wants to run the new division of his company. In his ambitious plea to his boss, he also cuts down a fellow employee based on their appearance and uses vulgar language towards another. Watch the fuck out! Oh shit! From these initial seven minutes, we learn everything we need to know about these guys before the pitch has even occurred. Mike is an obsessive perfectionist with ADHD tendencies and the bane of his existence is shoddily made products manufactured in China. Doug is a young at heart movie lover and hobbyist who simply wants the best for him and his partner. Jim is an egotistical corporate demon willing to cut anyone down who stands in his way. The essence of Mike and Doug's pocket link pitch is that they want to utilize the free wireless internet signal all across North America that no one has figured out how to use properly. There's free internet in this room right now. This would power their ability for the pocket link to use email from device to device. Okay, picture a pager, a cell phone, and an email machine all in one thing something that had never been done before, aided by a full keyboard built into the phone. The meeting does not go well, but the scene highlights what makes this film excellent. Firstly, the script is a big improvement on the other movies featured in this video. It launches you right into the action instead of launching you into the start of a movie. Another thing it has in common with Succession and The Social Network. But the script isn't actually trying to be Sorkin-esque. It's not lengthy and operatic, but real and identifiable with the dialogue akin to how people actually talk. Mike, super Super simple, hit him with the good news, bad news routine. 
good news, bad news routine, right? as opposed to the manicured prose of Sorkin's writing. All the same, it flows really nicely and throws in the numbers and business talk with reckless abandon, creating a great rhythm that you've got to pay attention to to keep up with. Additionally, the film avoids feeling like a Wikipedia movie. Its occupation with its three leading characters makes Blackberry feel more intimate and personal than if it were simply covering all the beats of the company's history. There's also a subtle comedic tone throughout the whole film. You're gonna cry, Mike. Oh. It's just disappointment? Yeah. You did great! There's just a great chemistry between Johnson and Baruchel that's incredibly strong, it just feels very real. The opening credits feature VHS footage of Mike and Doug's company from 1996, as if it were real found footage of Rim shot like a, once again, fake documentary. Interspersed to clips from popular culture from the 60s through to the 90s of how mobile and handheld communication devices have been represented in TV, film, and the tech world up to that point, giving context as to where we are in time. The VHS footage comes off as very playful and endearing. The guys from the Rim office all have the same energy as those local area network or LAN parties from the 90s and early 2000s and I love it. In this scene, the actors were playing, for real, the 1996 video game Command & Conquer Red Alert that was hooked up practically and so the camaraderie between these hardware developers is completely genuine and very infectious. <laughs> After some toing and froing, Jim is brought on board as co-CEO and then demands a prototype for the pocket link to be completed overnight. A shell I can wave around at a meeting. It could be a complete piece of shit. Mike then says this to Jim. There's a reason why your intercom is emitting white noise. It's because it was manufactured in China by engineers who didn't care. And now every office in the world has to suffer an annoying hiss, a blinking red light. We're not doing that. We are not just adding to the hiss. This is Mike's core value that impacts every decision he makes, but is then quickly told by Jim, Mike, are you familiar with the saying, perfect is the enemy of good? When it dawns on Mike that the company will go under if they aren't able to present a prototype, the team gets to work and completes the dingy device. After a shaky beginning, pitching it to Bell Atlantic, Mike sells them on the solution that these phones can send emails using an unused data network, the key fact that wins them over. Well, it's definitely the world's largest pager. Uh, no, it's actually the world's smallest email terminal. Uh, so try with your thumbs. Try typing with your thumbs. The phone is rebranded as BlackBerry and is then launched to massive success. Their innovation continues through the early 2000s by creating a brand new messaging system. Right, but these texts are sent via data. So behind the network's back. Essentially what iMessage would come to be on iPhones, but at the time, BlackBerry had total market share of the idea. But while you're watching all this happen, while you watch the CEO of Palm Pilot try and fail to buy them out, while you watch Mike become more of a corporate suit, while you watch the demand grow so that networks are pushed to breaking point, forcing the company to hire outside engineers to fix the issue. Oh, hey, it's someone show. I love that guy. While you're watching all this happen, there is a looming cloud of dread hanging over this film that only grows bigger the more successful Blackberry becomes. Like the bittersweet feeling of watching Jack and Rose fall in love on the Titanic, we know that an iceberg is coming that's going to wipe them all out. And towards the second act of the film, the iceberg arrives in the form of a 2007 keynote address delivered by Steve Jobs as he introduces Apple's revolutionary product. And we are calling it iPhone, an iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. The BlackBerry guys are completely blindsided, who are barely able to manufacture a trackpad prototype for their own upcoming redesign. It's, it's laggy as hell. Good enough, good enough. The third and final act is both the funniest and the most heartbreaking. Jim is distracted by his ambition to purchase a US hockey team and move it to Canada, while Mike and Doug flail around abysmally, attempting to defend their recent BlackBerry Bold device. I created this entire product class. I created this entire fucking market that has become instantly antiquated by the iPhone's all-screen display. Does an Adam have an iPhone? No, I have a BlackBerry Touch. Mike hastily improvises a future product that's an obvious copy of the iPhone, but with BlackBerry's trademark keyboard click. Where we have keys here, um, screen. The whole thing's a screen, uh, except when you press it, uh, you'll get that, that satisfying click. 
that Blackberry click. There's also this hilariously pathetic moment where Mike echoes Steve Jobs' rhetoric in his own disastrous pitch meeting. Screen, keyboard, phone. Are you getting it? This is where the long lenses creeping into the private meetings really have the best effect. Because suddenly BlackBerry have found themselves in a somewhat humiliated position where their ability to innovate has evaporated and now they're unable to conjure up anything that could possibly compete with the iPhone. They just wanted to solve a technical problem, not become a revolutionary lifestyle brand. Wow. And you really feel like they don't want any attention on them at this moment, but here we are peeking in, watching them crash and burn. The most devastating blow occurs when they attempt to come up with a new design, the BlackBerry Storm, to compete with the iPhone. It's a keyboard on a screen on a keyboard but the only way to get it shipped in time requires the Storm to be manufactured in China. The thing that Mike has always resolutely abstained from. Yeah, fuck it, do it. Huh. China. Corporate greed has all but consumed Jim to the point where he doesn't even register Apple's icebergs speeding towards him. We're gonna go from number one phone in the world to that phone that people had before they bought an iPhone. What's more, the SEC declares that the company committed fraud after hiring the 2003 engineers with illegally backdated stock options. Through Jim's own arrogance, he sabotages his hockey deal, resulting in my favorite line delivery from any film this year. I'm from Waterloo, where the vampires hang out! The company continues to spiral until the relationship between all three men is completely broken. When doing press for BlackBerry, Matt Johnson admitted that despite not trying to be the next social network, the film definitely had an influence on his own movie and of all the tonal and aesthetic similarities the two films share, I believe the final scene depicts the clearest example of that influence. I will say to anyone that hasn't yet seen the film, I mean, I know it's based on historical events, but if you want to see the ending in the context of the film and not this video, feel free to skip to this timestamp. Okay. It's now 2008, Jim and Doug are both out and Mike's inspecting a crate shipped from China of the new BlackBerry Storm, their first device with a touch screen. He opens it up and after tapping on the screen, it's clear that not only is it not very responsive, but there's a subtle hissing sound coming from the device. Mike manages to fix it, but then opens up another where the same hissing noise is also present. And just like Mark Zuckerberg in The Social Network, who begins that film getting broken up with and ends the film refreshing his friend request on the same girl's Facebook page, Mike Lazaridis, for all his values of quality and craftsmanship, ended up adding to the hiss after all, endlessly fixing phones one by one in a true full circle moment that humorously also echoes the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Plus, both The Social Network and BlackBerry end with two banging songs from 1967. Nearly every BlackBerry Storm was returned or replaced due to manufacturing errors, and Verizon sued RIM for $500 million to cover the costs, and that's where the movie leaves us. If you're only gonna watch one film that I listed in this video, please make sure it's BlackBerry. I really cannot recommend it enough. I mean, you may have clocked that by how much more time I spent talking about it. And I know currently it's quite hard to watch this film if you live outside of North America, but if you do get the chance to watch it, please don't pass it up. Because while this film should be commended for its incisive direction, razor sharp script, excellent soundtrack, hilarious performances, particularly Glenn Howerton's career turn as Jim Bolsley, seriously, this guy is a goddamn powerhouse in this film. You could acknowledge all these factors, but what really sets the film apart from these other brand biopics is that Blackberry is a story of failure. It is a corporate Icarus tale that delivers on its themes of greed, innovation, and selling out. The icky feeling of watching a film that centers itself around a product hits different here for the simple fact that you now cannot go out and buy a BlackBerry. Where it used to hold 45% of mobile phone market share, it now holds 0%. And that fact alone makes this story that much more fascinating and enticing as a viewer. Because unlike these other films, which are all about success, but leave behind an aftertaste of corporate consumerism, BlackBerry leaves you with a warning of how selling your soul for the almighty dollar will corrupt and destroy you in the end. And I personally think that's a more valuable message for audiences. It's a warning similar to the end of the social network, but you can still log on and use Facebook. Just the same as how you can buy a pair of Air Jordans or play a game of Tetris or eat a bag of flaming Hot Cheetos.
Well, this is gonna be a bit of a gear shift. <laughs> I mean, I probably should have just ended this list with Blackberry, but I know most people don't watch to the end and it is the best one. Okay, so while Flamin' Hot is the one that I find most people raise their eyebrows at or just straight up laugh at the fact that it got made in the first place. The story is, I feel, distinct and impressive, even if the beats of the movie feel somewhat formulaic. Now, what sets Flamin' Hot apart from these other brand biopics is that its perspective doesn't come from a white executive like Air or Blackberry. Essentially, the movie is an adaptation of the book A Boy, a Burrito, and a Cookie, from janitor to executive, which tells the story of Richard Montañez, a man who began as a janitor at the California Frito-Lay factory and within two decades became a highly paid executive of the company via his creation and marketing of the insanely popular snack food Flamin' Hot Cheetos an achievement that Montañez chalks up to relentless ambition and a lot of initiative. Initiative is kind of the key theme of the film. It gets brought up a lot. I can't stop thinking about your initiative. I was a guy with initiative and this was my magnum opus. Beginning when Richard was a child, getting bullied for eating a burrito for lunch before convincing the bullies that they're actually delicious. 25 cents. Burritos then become his school time hustle and it's all very charming. Initiative is what drives him to defy his father who beat him to raise a family to become somebody. Jesse Garcia is great as Richard and Annie Gonzalez as his childhood sweetheart turned wife Judy is also a standout. And like in Pinball, she's more than just the doting wife but an active player in the story and I appreciate that these films are doing more with these roles that could otherwise be very one dimensional. After a decade at Frito-Lay, Richard has an epiphany where he realizes that the thing that could save the company from the brutal Reagan years is a new product line with the flavors of Mexico. They had been there the entire time. He and his family conduct spice tests with all kinds of produce and herbs until they land on the right balance. Apparently in the Midwest, they had already been spicing things up for a while, except their ingredients came in test tubes and syringes. Oh, it's hot. This scene here is perhaps one of the most crucial moments in the whole film. I don't know what's going down over there. All I knew was our ingredients came from the ground, our roots. Why this is so pertinent is because two years before the release of the film, the Los Angeles Times released an extensive article that stated with corroborating evidence that Richard Montañez did not in fact invent Flamin' Hot Cheetos. And in a statement, Frito-Lay remarked, quote, we value Richard's many contributions to our company, especially his insights into Hispanic consumers, but we do not credit the creation of Flamin' Hot Cheetos or any Flamin' Hot products to him. I'm not gonna bore you with a he said, she said, but these food scientists who are rather comically depicted in the film perhaps deserve more credit than Richard for the actual creation of the product. But despite the liberties taken with the story, screenwriter for the film, Lewis Kolick himself stated that, quote, enough of the story was true, even if it wasn't entirely factual. And I know that might seem a bit controversial, but that's actually quite common for a movie about a quote unquote true story of X thing. What is true, and really the main takeaway of the film is Richard's rise from janitor to executive through sheer tenacity and initiative. It's kind of like an amalgamation of these other brand biopics. For example, Richard's big important pitch meeting towards the end sees him throw away his pre-planned words and instead pitch directly from the heart. This is it, everything I grew up with in a bag. And if you put this out there, you'll see that there's this whole market that no one else is paying attention to. Which is exactly what happens in Air. In her feature film directorial debut, Eva Longoria, Gabrielle Solis, yes, that Eva Longoria, does a decent job of bringing the story to life. The tone is never too heavy or overly dramatic. In fact, perhaps to let the audience know that they're in on the joke of a cheese doodle biopic, the film uses this meta contextualizing device where they play a scene with over the top gravitas before a voiceover comes in being like, um, Here's how it really happened. All right, all right. Judy says I exaggerate this part a lot. I guess it was a little bit more like this. I'm here! Pinball uses this exact same framing device in its climactic scene. No, no, stop, stop, stop. This is ridiculous. This is, this is a fantasy, nobody does that. And it's almost like the film's aware of how stale and predictable these over the top moments are in biopics and that their movie about pinball or spicy snacks probably doesn't justify such dramatic action with a swelling orchestra. Richard Montañez's story is an inspiring one and you leave the story feeling pretty good, but 
I also left wondering if the same thing could happen today. Would a CEO of a huge company ever take a call from a janitor shooting his shot like what happens here? Would he invite him to a meeting and discuss the product with him? Like much of the goodwill in this film, it seems like it's from a bygone era where people who work in factories and many custodial positions don't have access to that kind of opportunity with how mega corporations work these days. These kind of business Cinderella stories feel very tied to the 80s and 90s period that they hail from. If we go above and beyond in our workplaces time and time again, people are taken advantage of and overcommit without being rewarded or even acknowledged for using the same kind of initiative that Richard used. They might even be fired for going around management. However, that may be a cynical takeaway from this movie. I think if people watch this and feel motivated to think beyond the scope of their everyday and go after their own enterprise, then I think that's a net positive. So reflecting on these corporate product biopics, I think it's easy to look at the titles and believe the movie is going to be purely about the product itself. Oh, it's a movie about the Air Jordan, or the game Tetris, or the Blackberry phone. But of course you watch them and realize that's not what any of them are really about. Air is an underdog story. Tetris is a Russian spy story. Pinball is about the choices we make. Blackberry is an Icarus story. Flame and Heart is about family and initiative. But the titles are what hook people in, right? They are brands after all, why wouldn't you market your film on an already popular IP? The work in many ways is done for you. But even still, why have five movies about products and brands released within three months of each other proven to be such a hit with audiences and critics alike? Are these the stories that our culture deserves? Well, let's face it, culturally, we're in a really weird and bizarre time. I love my popcorn. Movies. Popcorn. On top of everything else going on politically, environmentally, there's also the fact that life in 2023 often feels like the world is run by about 10 different companies. And the eccentric billionaires at the helm <laughs> oh man, it didn't go through. Seemingly have way too much influence and more control over our lives than we like to admit. The internet is more unhinged and harder to wrap your head around than ever before with things like augmented reality and AI being injected into our lives before we've even contemplated the true risk of going down such a dangerous rabbit hole. The unrelenting passage of time is hurtling us towards an unpredictable and scary future. And so what do people turn to when anxiety of the future arises? Nostalgia. We go back to the past for comfort. I mean, why do you think Disney's live action remakes and 80s franchise reboots and sequels typically do so well? They wrap us in the warm, comforting blanket of youth and innocence that we're craving to return to. And that same comforting nostalgia is baked into these brand biopics. From the quaint joys of a game of pinball in the 1970s, to the retro fashion of Nike in the 80s and the monoculture moment of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, to picking up your first Game Boy and experiencing the simple pleasure of playing Tetris, to the innocence of Blackberry's 90s and 2000s era of communications and the internet before social media came along and corrupted it at all. But I don't think it's just about trying to live inside one's childhood, which by the way, I am not advocating for. I think there's another reason why, in particular, these tech-focused product biopics are being made and why we love watching them. It's a way for us to understand the present moment that we're in. How did we go from writing on someone's Facebook wall in college to the metaverse? How did we go from, wow, email on your phone to not being able to exist without one of these? Matt Johnson, writer and director of BlackBerry, has, I think, an excellent perspective on this IP stampede, a term I picked up from him, actually. In an episode of the Big Picture podcast, Johnson discusses how film has always shown us who we are, typically through myth. And he then quotes singer Bjork when describing his explanation for the popularity of these type of films. Bjork was asked what her job is, and uh, she said, my job as an artist is to connect the myths of my past with the future. And I think there's so much to that notion. Brands, and particularly tech products, do kind of consume our lives in a way that they just didn't 15, 20 years ago. And I believe the purpose of these films is to unpack the bizarre cultural landscape we now live in. Sure, we can be cynical about how culturally bankrupt Hollywood is and that they've run out of ideas and how the incredible stories we used to see on film have now been replaced by ones of capitalistic conquest. But something to remember is that although these films may be about brands and products, 
they are at least standalone films that do not suggest any kind of sequel or franchise treatment. Which, in a way, recalls the kind of cinematic landscape of the pre-Marvel era, where broadly appealing, feel-good films were ubiquitous in movie theatres everywhere, and I think that's a positive development. And something that I think has been missing from the conversation about these movies is that products that have sparked joy in people and shaped who they are are not valueless things. Beyond that element of nostalgia, there's something that, once again, Matt Johnson puts into words better than I could. Things catch on for a reason. People are interested in, we'll take something as benign as the video game Tetris, okay? There is a spiritual element to that, whether you want to admit it or not, right? This is a hugely successful property where you drop blocks and clear rows, and people are mesmerized by that. And in that, there is some kind of truth. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but to completely ignore it and just say, oh, this is just an addictive piece of software and that's all it is, is in some ways denying the humanity in you that makes you love Tetris. And don't do that. Because then all you're doing is, is, is denying parts of yourself that maybe you're not proud of, but must be there. Something that I'm not necessarily proud of, but I can't deny, is that I really quite liked the Super Mario Brothers movie. I know that's less of a brand biopic and more of a brand come to life film, but it really had an effect on me. <laughs> and I know a lot of people thought it was just a blatant 90 minute commercial for Nintendo with a paper thin story and lots of flashing light and colors. And it was that. But it also made me reflect on how these games have shaped me into the person that I am today. How they bonded me to my brother and sister when we were young how the music helped inform my love of rhythm and melody, and how its undeniable sense of fun and joy are major tenets of how I live my life today. Like, you can go into the Barbie movie this month aware that it's just one big commercial for Mattel, starring the world's highest paid actress. In fact, it's always vital to be aware of what it is you're consuming. But you can also allow yourself to feel the joy that Barbie sparked in millions of people around the world. There is value in that, and there is humanity in that. Well, hey everybody, thanks so much for watching to the end. That's very cool of you. Um, I'm gonna be frank, I'm really trying to get to 100,000 subscribers. So if you like this video and wanna see more from my channel, feel free to subscribe. I think that'd also be cool. And if you wanna support me, I have my Patreon page where you can watch a ton of monthly bonus videos that aren't on YouTube and be featured in the credits like these very chill people. The link for that is in the description. Thank you so much to my existing patrons. And yeah, what did you think of these brand biopics? Have you seen any of them? Are they the death of cinema or do they represent a new beginning for Hollywood? Let me know in the comments. Otherwise, that's all from me. Hope you're having a great day and I'll see you later. Bye.